Our next scripture reading comes to us again from the book of Exodus, just one chapter later. Exodus 17, verses 1 through 7. Let us once again lean in and listen to God's word for us this day. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt? To kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, what shall I do for these people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, ahead of the people, take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it, so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massah and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Siblings in Christ, this is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Come, O Holy Spirit, come. Come as the fire and burn. Come as the wind and cleanse. Come as the light and reveal. Convict us. Convert us. Consecrate us until we are wholly thine. And now, Lord, my prayer is this, that the words of my mouth and the words of all our hearts, that these will be found pleasing and acceptable to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. The year was 1927. The place was University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia, and the person was Thomas Parnell, Professor Thomas Parnell, who initiated what has been recognized by the Guinness Book of World Records as the longest running laboratory experiment. And if you weren't at the 830 service, you can answer this next question. Does anyone know what the experiment is? Okay, we shall go forward. It is called the pitch experiment. The pitch experiment. Professor Parnell sought to demonstrate to students that some substances which appear to be solid are actually highly viscous. And so he poured a, a heated sample of pitch into a sealed funnel, and he allowed it to settle for three years. Pitch, you will recall, is a petroleum-based substance with high viscosity and stickiness. It is what Noah used to waterproof the ark. And so in 1930, Professor Parnell cuts the seal at the neck of the funnel, allowing the pitch to start flowing. Two years later, the first drop formed. This was about the same time that most of Parnell's students had graduated. And then, December 1938, the first drop fell. 
The second fell about eight years later, February 1947. On average, a drop fell once every eight years until between the seventh and the eighth drop. It took 12 years. Now, on November, in the year 2000, the eighth drop fell. The reason? They installed air conditioning. The average temperature had dropped in the room, causing it to flow slower. And then the ninth drop fell in April 2014. There is a live stream of this experiment happening in real time. This live stream has given rise to a group of folks who affectionately call themselves the Tenth Watch. They view the live stream incessantly, hoping, waiting, watching to see the tenth pitch drop in real time. When you click the link on the website to go to the live stream, the slide that pops up just before the live stream reads, Hi, only eight or so years to go. <laughs> they say watching the pitch experiment is as exciting as watching grass grow and paint dry at the same time. <laughs> now, why do I bring this up? I bring it up because generally, we are a people who are not good at waiting. In college, I recall a, another experiment that I learned about. It was either an intro to sociology or an intro to psychology class. I learned it as the M&M experiment. Uh, others may have learned it as the marshmallow experiment. And the premise is this. You place a child in a room at a table with a plate in front of the child. There are either three M&Ms or one marshmallow on the plate. The child is told, if you can wait 15 minutes, we will double what's on the plate. Wait 15 minutes, you get six M&Ms or two marshmallows. And generally speaking, the children could not do it. They could not delay their gratification. They consumed the three M&Ms or the one marshmallow, giving up the opportunity to double up on the snack in front of them. In the words of, of, of that iconic song sung by Veruca Salt in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, our mantra is often, I want it now. Often. What we want is for life to return to the way it once was. In modern parlance, we want it to go back to normal. And yet we know, don't we, that life doesn't necessarily return to normal as fast as we'd like it to. Th that is, if it ever returns to normal. In fact, the, the more years that I live, the more I begin to identify with people who have shared with me following the death of a loved one in their lives that the phrase, the new normal, it just doesn't work. That's beginning to make more and more sense to me as I get older. Because is there such a thing as normal? I'm beginning to think, no, there is no normal. There is, however, right here, right now, our present circumstance, the, the present predicament, some may call it. it. It is how we move through such times. As people of faith, we believe we believe we are not going through this time alone. We are joined on the journey. 
We're joined by the God who provides, the the God who saves, the, the God who sustains, the God who is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And when we cannot sense this presence of God in our midst, what we can rely on are the people around us, the people whom God has placed with us to go on this journey together. And it involves, as Dutch theologian and writer Henry Nouwen puts it, waiting and patience. A waiting person, Nouwen writes, is a patient person. The word patience means the willingness to stay where we are and live the situation out to the full in the belief that something hidden there will manifest itself. Which brings us to our Exodus readings this day what some might refer to as wilderness wandering stories. And so before we jump into those texts, let's set the stage as to where the Israelites are right now in their wilderness wandering. The people of Israel began complaining about the trials and tribulations of their liberation from Egypt even before it had been accomplished. In Exodus 14, the people panic when they see the Egyptians pursuing them and they bitterly ask Moses if he brought them out of Egypt just so they could die in the wilderness. In Exodus 15, the people complain to Moses because the water at Marah is bitter. In Exodus 16, they complain because they have a lack of food. And then in today's text, which one writer I've read calls it yet another gripe session, it follows directly on this miraculous provision of bread from heaven, manna. The Israelites at this point in the journey, they haven't been in the wilderness very long. They've only been there about two and a half months. Between the description of Exodus 15 to 16. And they find themselves encamped now in an inhospitable place, which is what the biblical word wilderness designates. This place they're in is called Sin. It's an uncertain location, though related etymologically to that word Sinai. From this wilderness of sin, the the whole congregation of Israelites sets out. Now, the Hebrew people, they're given various designations within the biblical text, the most commonly used phrase being simply the people. The phrase used here, the, the whole congregation, refers to the company of Israel in their exodus time. It's a technical term found commonly there within the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old or First Testament. It describes a people who have been delivered by the miraculous work of the Lord, and therefore they are God's particular people. Although the Hebrew word used to describe Israel here can mean simply a group or a circle, in the overwhelming majority of cases, it has a religious connotation to it. It is people uniquely and self-consciously related to the Lord. Now, the exact location of Israel's encampment, Rephidim, is unknown. But the fact remains that the company chose the location without water to rest in. It suggests that the spot they chose was not their first preference. It's likely that their circumstance, in this case probably fatigue, determined their choice. We've all, I think, a time or two in our lives found ourselves in similar situation. We find ourselves stopped because of fatigue 
or an unplanned circumstance in a spot that is not our preference. So what do we do when we find ourselves in just such a place? Priest and scientist Pierre Tillard de Chardin might offer some advice. He writes, above all, trust in the slow work of God. We are quite naturally impatient in everything to reach the end without delay. We should like to skip the intermediate stages. We are impatient of being on the way to something unknown, something new. And yet it is the law of all progress that it is made by passing through some stages of instability. And that it may take a very long time. And so I think it is with you, Chardin continues. Your ideas mature slowly. Let them grow. Let them shape themselves without undue haste. Don't try to force them as though you could be today what time, that is to say, grace and circumstances acting upon your own goodwill will make you tomorrow. Only God could say what this new spirit gradually forming within you will be. Give our Lord the benefit of believing that the hand of God is leading you and accept the anxiety of feeling yourself in suspense and incomplete. What do we do in such circumstances? We could, like the Israelites, move into complaint mode. Why bring us this far only to have us die? At least if we'd stayed back in Egypt, we would have had food enough to eat. I offer an alternative. I offer an alternative in an exercise that is both honest and hopeful. A week or so ago, just you know, right through the walls, out in front of the church on the lawn to the side, we gathered with our 6th through 12th grade youth for another of our s'mores and moors gathering. We closed our time that night by checking in with each other. We shared our joys and our concerns. Some may have learned this through sharing your roses and thorns, your highs, your lows. In our home, when our child was in the first grade, we began a similar dinner ritual. We began to go around the nightly dinner table and we would share what was the best thing and the worst thing that happened today or this week. What we discovered in that practice as a family, what we're hoping to discover in that practice with our youth, is how to frame our prayers for one another. To be able to lift to God our gratitude and our anxious moments. That practice does not discount our current predicament, and it does not discount our hopeful anticipation that things can get better. It is a bit prophetic if you take a basic definition of prophet into account. A prophet is one who stands between God and the people. And on behalf of the people, says to God how it is. And then on behalf of God, says to the people how it can be. We never discount where we are. We embrace the reality. We stay honest. 
We never discount where we might be going. We embrace the unknown. We stay hopeful. Our recent General Assembly, which concluded this past week, has declared, we are a people who can faithfully live into hope. One of our Presbyterian creeds affirms that we believe in life and death we belong heart and soul to Almighty God. Perhaps you prefer the words of the Christian mystic and theologian Julian of Norwich who said all shall be well and all shall be well and all manner of thing shall be well. Or maybe you like John Lennon, not John Calvin, John Lennon. We all love John Calvin. John Lennon, though, captured, I believe, the intent of Julian of Norwich's words when he said, everything will be okay in the end. And if it is not okay, then it is not the end. In life and in death, we belong, heart and soul, to Almighty God. The God who provides, the God who saves, the God who sustains, the God who is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the God who calls us, and the God who joins us on the journey together. Alleluia and Amen.